on today's show some mailbag questions for your listening pleasure as well as last on kevin durant staying in brooklyn but also have the hawks tie in there as well tyson etienne officially a member of the hawks roster and much more coming up you are locked on hawks your daily atlanta hawks podcast part of the locked on podcast network your team every day Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1301 of the Lots on the Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Thursday in late August. And thank you for joining us, as always, on the podcast. Make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out across podcast platforms. That, of course, includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and on the video side, we are on YouTube. So please subscribe and follow the show on that platform. In recent days, I did a two-part podcast with Glenn Willis of Peachtree Hoops. That's a fun conversation. Long-awaited player capsule on Trey Young, part one, kind of a look back at Trey Young's season last year, and then part two, looking ahead to this year, for the most part, DeJounte Murray integration, all that fun stuff. A good conversation with Glenn, who is very, very smart, and that is on the feed right now. Before that, lots of guests as well, wall-to-wall coverage, even in the offseason. We are one of the few podcasts that continues throughout the break, uh, you know, three times a week, four times a week, something like that even when we are in the down period of August. But things are ramping up at this point in time. In fact, it's going up on a Thursday as you're listening to this podcast or watching it right now. And the opener in the preseason for the Hawks is in Abu Dhabi in exactly six weeks from now. So we're getting very much closer to the start of the season. Media Day is only like four or five weeks away at this point. We're getting closer. and Stick with us. We'll have all kinds of stuff. Also, later on in this podcast, we'll talk about the Kevin, the Kevin Durant rumor, pseudo-rumor, report, however you want to say that. That's coming up on the show, so don't turn away. That's definitely coming, even if the, the case have kind of resolved, at least in the short term, uh, at this point in time. But first, some actual news from this week, um, even if it's kind of what we expected. So Tyson Etienne. The Hawks announced on Monday that they signed Tyson Etienne, who played with the Hawks at Summer League, Wichita State Guard, etc. Because the Hawks do not announce details of signings per team policy, people kind of misread that a little bit uh, as to what was happening. So I'm here to kind of correct the record a little bit from what I was hearing and seeing online back in back in June, actually after the draft. We covered this at the time as well. Uh, David Meneman of ESPN reported the Hawks were going to sign Etienne to an Exhibit 10 contract. I heard the same. It was widely out there. And again, that's a national outlet reporting that it was kind of assumed to, that to be true. From there, he played with the Hawks in Summer League. He wasn't like incredible in Summer League. There was one great game in which he kind of led them back in a lot of ways in the second half and was really hot. But the rest of Summer League was not that impressive for Nets. He was fine by all means, but not like crazy, crazy good either. Turned some heads, though, and became memorable because of that one uh, explosive performance that he had in Las Vegas. I fast forward to now, and the Hawks basically just announced the deal that we kind of already knew about. So it was not a huge surprise to me or anybody around the team, but people kind of were taken aback by it that it was actually announced and kind of all all that stuff. So uh, Exhibit 10 contracts are a little bit nerdy in concept, so I'll try to do my best to kind of dumb this down a little bit. They're basically one-year deals with small guarantees to allow some flexibility on the team side. The deal has to be between 5000 and 50000 guaranteed. So at very minimum, Tyson Etienne will earn between that amount in guaranteed money from the Hawks. That's, of course, nice for him. Um, if the Hawks were to waive him during or after training camp, the structure allows for the Hawks to assign him to College Park. So that's part of the reason why teams do this kind of contract setup is because that small guarantee allows them to kind of filter him to College Park and have them close to the team, even if it's not on the Billy roster on a two-way. So he's still being in the organization, et cetera. That is, again, usually what happens here. Not always, but usually on these Exhibit 10 contracts, unless the guy makes the team out of camp, for the most part, they get cut and sent to the G League facility. Um, other options on Exhibit 10s, they can, uh, the Hawks can convert the deal to a two-way contract unilaterally without consent. They could just kind of go ahead and do that if they want to. But right now, the Hawks have both two-way slots filled. So that's not a, that's not a logical option unless they were to do something else with Sean e. Brown or um, Trent Forrest. And the last option, of course, would be to, would be Etienne making the team out of camp in which they can convert him to an NBA contract. Um, that is not the likely scenario, I wouldn't say. But listen, uh, part of the appeal here for the player side is that the Hawks have a roster spot open, technically, if they want to keep it open potentially for tax purposes. Etienne will have a chance to impress in training camp, and it would not like absolutely stun me if he made the team. Now, I would say, if I had to guess right now, the, le- the most likely scenario, as I said on Twitter the other day, was that the Hawks will get him to camp, evaluate him a little bit, and then wave him at some point along the way and have him in College Park. That is by far the most likely scenario. That's not definite, but it's certainly the most likely scenario. 
They like him, obviously, enough to give him an Exhibit 10 contract back in June. They didn't have to do that. Maybe they did have him on Summer League, et cetera, but obviously he probably had some offers along the way, but they gave him some guaranteed money, even if a pretty small amount. Um, from there, I would say there's the other potential option would be the Hawks maybe uh, converting either Trent Forrest or Shawnee Brown from a two-way to a full deal and then giving Etienne the two-way. That's probably the most likely scenario besides him being waived and sent to College Park, but obviously could make the team out of camp as well. So long story short, nothing new here that was not already known around the team, but because the Hawks announced it on a Monday and the way the Hawks always announce their deals with very little specifics, I will just interpret that for you and just say, look, he's not going to definitely be on the team. This is not a signing where they gave him a full guaranteed contract. This is a very small guarantee. Exhibit 10 contracts are uh, usually, again, not always, but usually sent to College Park uh, slash the G League at some point in time. Okay, now it's time to dive into the mailbag. The rest of the show will be mailbag adjacent questions and filler stuff along the way. We got a bunch of good questions. In fact, I'm only going to get to like half of them. So I definitely want to fill up your timelines and your, uh, your listening ears with all kinds of mailbag stuff in the coming days because we don't have that much to talk about in Hawksland. But uh, I do have three or four more questions that I have written down here that I might not get to today, but please keep them coming. Always on the show, um, fire them to me on Twitter at Locked on Hawks or send them to me via email at Locked on Hawks at gmail.com. Okay, first question. It's kind of newsy in itself as well. Vic asks, did you see the ESPN has the Hawks at 15th? That seems low to me, says Vic. Um, so ESPN had, had their kind of initial power rankings come out. Uh, earlier this week on, I think it was Monday, late in, late in August, for the first time since the finals were over. They, they did sort of a post-finals edition, and then now this is the first time for the new season. The Hawks were actually 19th in the post-finals rankings for ESPN, so it's a little bit higher than that. There's not a ton of analysis attached to it as to why the Hawks got 15th, so keep that in mind as well. I think most people are going to end up with the top, you know, the same kind of top 10 or 11 teams in some order. ESPN had the Warriors, Celtics, Bucks, Grizzlies, Suns, Clippers, Heat, Mavericks, Nuggets, and Sixers. So we're going to start from there at number 11 for this purpose. Um, ESPN had the Wolves at 11, then the Raptors at 12, the Nets at 13, and the Bulls at 14 before the Hawks. Now, the Wolves being ahead of the Hawks is not like surprising to me um, after, after getting Gobert, et cetera. If they didn't have the Gobert deal, I think the Hawks would be better than them for sure, but Gobert's really good. And obviously, Anthony Edwards could take a step forward as well. The Raptors were better than the Hawks last year. I'll say that right now. The Raptors were better than the Hawks last year, pretty clearly in the metrics, et cetera. And people do have sky expectations for Scotty Barnes. They added Otto Porter. I think the Hawks are in the same tier as Toronto. That didn't, like, stun me either. Um, also, this came out before the Kevin Durant saga concluded, which, which, by the way, we'll come back to later on in the podcast on the whole Durant front. But uh, I would imagine the ESPN will raise the nets up, as most people did. Been online, open the nets, like 51 wins, something like that. So uh, let's just say if, if KD's still in Brooklyn, expectations are going to be a lot higher for the nets than this. Um, and then the one that I do have a problem with is the, net, is the Hawks being behind the Bulls. So Chicago fell off a cliff last year at the end of the year, and they also got the best possible season probably from DeMar DeRozan. Um, they had some injury stuff for sure, but they won 46 games last year, even with DeRozan having the season of his life. Um, they do have Levine back, and they have some tweaks on the margins, but I think – and by the way, it's possible the Hawks could be ahead of uh, – sorry, the Bulls could be ahead of the Hawks. You know, I've seen some definitive statements about like the Bulls and the Cavs, and I, I think that I would have the Hawks ahead of the Bulls and the Cavs. There are scenarios for sure where the Bulls finish ahead of the Hawks. So it's not like it's a crazy, crazy, crazy thing, but I would definitely have the Hawks ahead of the Bulls right now and the Cavs, et cetera, in the Eastern Conference on paper. Um, by the way, after the Hawks on this list was the Pelicans, the Cavs, the Lakers, the Blazers in that order. Uh, the Lakers might be higher now. They traded for Patrick Beverly on Wednesday night, but keep that in mind as well. So, uh, I'm sure Vic was not the only Hawks fan that was um, thinking the Haw Hawks should be higher in this space than they actually were. Um, so I'm not surprised by that necessarily either. But um, I do agree. I think at least one spot higher than this would be appropriate for the Hawks. Maybe a couple, maybe a couple spots higher than that. But I think uh, for the most part, you're going to see a lot of these rankings. And I, I would imagine the Hawks are not going to be in the top ten of most of them. And uh, just kind of brace yourself for that. If you, even if you disagree, it shouldn't be too shocking to you at this point in time. All right, before we get to a break, I just want to tell you, by the way, again, the KD stuff is coming after the break. But before we get to that, a word from our sponsors on the show today. Imagine you're hanging out with some friends, putting back a few drinks. A few drinks becomes a few too many drinks as the evening comes to an end. People start to leave. And you think about actually calling for a ride. But instead, you decide that you live pretty nearby, thinking that it's no big deal to just drive home and make it uh, at some point. And after all, what are the odds that you get pulled over at this close to your house, even if that happens, What's the worst that could happen? Would your insurance go up or would you lose your license? 
um, well, maybe you could tow your car or hurt someone or even kill yourself or somebody else. At this point, everyone should know the risks of drunk driving. The results are tragic and often deadly. But that does not always stop everybody from getting behind the wheel, even if they absolutely shouldn't. And that is why police officers are out there looking for you and other people right now. They're impaired on the roads looking to save lives. So if you think it's okay to drive after a few too many drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It's pretty easy to go ahead and do that in the modern era, so there's no excuse not to. It takes one mistake to change your life or the life of somebody else forever. Instead, drive sober or get pulled over. All right, so a lot has happened with Kevin Durant in our last couple of days. Uh, I was going to touch on this uh, immediately after I actually had to post the podcast with Glenn a little bit quicker than I wanted to because there was the Durant stuff out there. And then I almost recorded Monday night, and then I held off. I'm glad I did because Tuesday morning a lot changed in this instance. So um, on Tuesday morning, there was a press release that was very odd, honestly, from the Nets and boardroom, which is KD's media entity, that kind of announced that the Nets and KD were going to move forward together and presumably take them off the market. That was the indication of the reporting that was out there as well. Um, this could still blow up. That's important to keep in mind. Just because KD is on, on board to come to training camp, et cetera, uh, people were kind of sharing the Dwight Howard, Stan Van Gundy stuff from back in the day where that kind of went badly. Um, also the Kobe Dwight stuff from the Lakers, et cetera. There's nothing assured at all here. Keep that in mind. KD probably is not overjoyed at this point, just suddenly to be in Brooklyn and excited to say, but um, all indications are we, we, have, we have to kind of bank on him being with the Nets this year, at least for a while. So plan on that at this stage. Now, with all that said, Monday morning before that announcement, there was some reporting from Sham Sarania that turned some heads with the Hawks and obvious for obvious reasons. So in his inside pass column, Shams reported, I would say heavily focused on the Durant stuff, but the big revelation from a non-Hawk standpoint was that the Grizzlies were going to be kicking the tires on Durant. That was kind of the headliner, but there was a sort of one and only one Hawks inclusion in that column. That prompted a lot of questions to me and people kind of reacted to this. I'm going to use the question in the mailbag technically. It comes from Courtney who says, I may, I know it may not matter now, but are you going to talk about Kevin Durant still and the Hawks? It seems like, it seems like fans were kind of divided on it. So uh, to answer the question and others that were probably in the same vein as Courtney's question, Shams reported that the Hawks offered John Collins, DeAndre Hunter, and a draft pick for Kevin Durant, according to his sources. So a few things to hit on here. Um, number one, the Hawks absolutely should have called on Kevin Durant. Atlanta's trying to win now. That's not up for debate. There's ownership pressure. There's organizational pressure, fan pressure, et cetera. Basically, any organization in the league that is trying to win right now should have at least called the Nets to see what was going on. So no surprise there. Um, no matter what you think about KD, people kind of, I think, are maybe a little bit low on KD at this point in time. He's really, really good. Um, regardless, the Hawks should have called on Kevin Durant. That's number one. Number two. What the Hawks reportedly offer is not really a real offer for Kevin Durant. That would be interesting for the Nets to compare to what's been reported, what would, what would have actually taken to get Durant, et cetera. Um, I know Sham said on Wednesday that the closest offer reportedly for Boston was a deal around Jalen Brown and Derek White in a pick. Um, that's a much better offer than the Hawks offering Collins and Hunter plus a pick. Um, and even then, they obviously didn't do that deal. Brooklyn didn't do that deal. So um, they've, they've kind of asked for a lot more than the Hawks reportedly offered here. For one, I did a little bit of reporting and talked to some league people around the league that I know that are with teams or agents, et cetera. Got some funny responses. I'm not going to read them all to you, but this is even before they pulled KD off the market. Um, some examples, um, there was someone that told me that there was no way the Hawks actually wanted that deal out there because it was so bad that it makes them look bad for even offering it. Again, that's someone in the league that says that. Another called it, quote, laughable, end quote. Another said that it might have been an interesting offer if it had three, four, or five picks attached instead of one. So obviously... That's not a scientific example of the league, but it was pretty universally seen as an offer that was not competitive if that was the actual offer the Hawks made that was reported by Shams. Beyond that, um, again, there, there's sort of two schools of thought as to what it would take for the Nets to trade Durant even before this. Um, one of them, again, was the Jalen Brown scenario where like a guy that they obviously think is like a top 30, 35 player in the league to build their rest of their team around and stay competitive. Or maybe like apparently the Nets told the Raptors not even to offer without Scotty Barnes attached. That's a prime. I'm probably a little bit lower on Barnes than some, but that's he's considered to be a future star, etc. The other thing that teams could do would be offer a ton of picks, and the Hawks can't really do that because they don't have the picks anymore to trade. Now they only, they, they actually can trade picks. We'll come back to that in a second, but um, you know, not not the entire bevy of picks that some teams can offer. So I'm higher on Collins than most people are. I will say that, but the Hawks have had him on the market for two plus years now. 
And he's not going to move the needle as the best player in a Durant deal. Again, Collins is really good. He's not quite that kind of guy. Um, Hunter has trade value for sure. But as discussed numerous times in the space, he is not proven to be a top tier guy at this point. He does have some real trade value for sure. Former top five pick, theoretical value, all that stuff. But um, he's going to be more expensive after this season. And again, he's not going to change the landscape of a Kevin Durant trade. Again, this is Kevin Durant, future Hall of Fame, top 15 player of all time, Kevin Durant. Um, also, there is the fact that it was one single pick, um, at least according to the reporting, is pretty funny. Um, now, again, the Hawks... I would assume that's the Hawks' own pick this year, probably, if I had to guess, after what they sent out for Murray, which is not a fantastic pick by any means. The Hawks are going to be pretty good this year by all accounts, so having their own pick uh, probably somewhere in the teens or 20s, not great. Um, It's either that or it's the Hawks' 2029 pick, because, by the way, they cannot trade 2024 or 2028 right now because of the step-in rule. That's not to go down the rabbit hole there, but the Hawks only can trade two of their own first-round picks right now in any transaction. This year's 2023 pick, or 2029. They cannot trade 24, 28. They, they, they can do swap rights. They cannot trade those picks. So, and they also could, uh, they could trade the sort of potentially um, fake first round pick in the Kevin, in the Kevin Herter trade, because it's not their own pick, but it's protected. So the, the value on that pick is a little bit less than some of the other picks that are out there. So if the report was draft compensation, instead of a draft pick, it'd be interesting because the Hawks could again, offer two picks, two swaps, plus the herder pick if they wanted to. Now, that was not reported to be the deal that happened here. So um, anyway, all indications are the Hawks, either, the Nets are either going to want a top-tier player or, or a top-tier prospect as the center of the deal or maybe a crazy p- package of picks. The Hawks have neither of those to offer because I'll just say this out loud. The Hawks would never trade Kevin uh, – sorry, trade Trey Young for Kevin Durant. That's the only logical option, obviously. Maybe the Murray thing would be interesting. But by the way, Mur- Murray makes so much less money than Kevin Durant that even if they could do that – there's just a lot of things. So it would not be Trey. It would not be Jante. If this all happened, it'd be a package of, you know, Collins has got to be in there or Capella to make the money work, et cetera. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to avoid the entire rabbit hole. But last thing here, um, this does not mean that the Hawks would be totally out on Durant if they made him available again. And they could offer more than this. The Hawks are permitted to, and organizationally, they could offer more than they offered here reportedly. If they wanted to get actually super aggressive and serious about a Durant pursuit right now, I'd have to imagine that a Kongwu would be in the deal. Um, obviously, the Hawks don't want to trade a Kongwu. He, they like him a lot. I like him a lot. I think he is, um, just for the record, I think a Kongwu has more trade value than probably either Collins or Hunter. Um, Collins is a better player right now. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, I think given where Kongwu was drafted, the buzz on him, the fact that he's still cheap, he's, he's the youngest of these guys, etc. But I think that the Nets would also be asking for multiple picks slash assets in the deal, maybe all the picks the Hawks can offer, or maybe someone like Griffin or Johnson in the, as part of the deal as well. Anyway, for this, to, for this to actually be a structure that works, I would probably have to guess it's something like Collins, Hunter, Kongwu, and a couple more assets, um, not just Collins, Hunter, and one pick. That was never going to be enough. My apologies. I know there were some Hawks fans that thought that it was actually going to be too much, and I would just say that's not true. Uh, I know you, you can certainly value Collins or Hunter and not want KD. I get all that. Um, you know, KD is awesome. I, I would definitely want KD if you're trying to win. But um, even if you just are super duper low on the KD experience, um, this is not a good offer. That would that would be good. No, no one that I talked to, literally no one that I talked to was like, that's a good offer for Kevin Durant. No one. Uh, so uh, there it is. Anyway, it's fun to think about Kevin Durant on the team with Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. I'd love to cover that team. It'd be a lot of fun. But the offer, again, was not going to be getting it done. It could change. Um, obviously, now the Nets have reportedly pulled him back, so we'll see if that actually changes in the near future. But for now, KD in Brooklyn, and by the way, KD being in Brooklyn does not necessarily help the Hawks with regard to this season because the Nets are now good uh, with KD and presumably Kyrie and Ben Simmons potentially on the team. The Nets are going to be very good this year if KD is healthy. Next question on the agenda comes from A.T. Elian, who says, do you think the Hawks make another move now that the Durant, the Durant situation has been resolved? Um Question is good, of course. Um, I don't think there's anything imminent. And for the record, I don't think the Hawks were actually like kind of shaping their offseason around Kevin Durant or anything like that. So I would imagine they were not like holding their breath here. Um, I also don't think the Hawks are like hanging up the phone. Teams are starting to ramp up a little bit. There was, of course, a trade last night on Wednesday between the Lakers and um, the Jazz. I think guys are back from vacation now. For offices are kind of ramping up again. But at the same time, it's been very, very quiet around pretty much every team, but especially around the Hawks since like the middle of July, like six weeks now. I think they're prepared to go into the season with the roster they have at this moment in time for the most part. I could see a move happening that would not stun me at all, but it is certainly more likely than not that the Hawks kind of go into the, go into the season with their current like kind of core roster in place. It becomes more interesting at that point, like in like January, February, if they're either playing really well 
and want to kind of, kind of go all in or struggling and kind of maybe want to sell a little bit. We'll see how that all works. But for now, I think that the, if the most likely scenario is the Hawks kind of standing pat for the most part when it comes to major moves between now and the season, which is, again, like six weeks away at this point. Okay, before we get to another mail question, maybe, maybe two more, but especially at least one more uh, question on today's podcast, a word from our sponsors on the show. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, and there is always something new at Bet Online. In fact, later in the show today, we'll be talking about some Bet Online odds on conferences and division odds, and even beyond the new offerings that are always at Bet Online. They're the fastest, easiest way to check out all of your sports betting needs. Find all of the favorite sports and events that you have at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games with a ton of future facing action. That, of course, includes football season on the horizon, NFL stuff, college football stuff divisions, conferences, etc. NBA future odds firmly in play as long as baseball as well. Playoffs are approaching in the baseball world, of course. Find reviews and news of every league that includes MLB, NFL, and NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, soccer, golf, tennis, auto racing, horse racing, rugby, entertainment bets, and much more. That line is also top resources for your online stuff and across the wagering information. That includes live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts. And they have you covered across the board. Bet Online has casino games. They have poker and other ways to get on the action if you're not all that way into sports, even if you're listening to this podcast, which, which you probably are into sports at this point. Head to Bet Online right now or use your mobile device to get in all of the trends and the action that is happening today across the sports world. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay, and the next question on the agenda comes from Christopher, who says, since the Hawks had a great half-court offense the last couple of years, they did not seem to emphasize transition baskets. What is your take on how the coaches will adjust to take more advantage of the fast break? Thank you, Christopher, for the question. And uh, just to kind of tell, tell you about the premise here, because Christopher is accurate about the lack of transition emphasis. Um, last year, cleaning the glass had the Hawks as the 24th team in the league. So, you know, seventh worst in transition frequency. They only ran at about 13.9% of possessions. Um, in that same cleaning the glass metric, they were actually eighth best in efficiency. They scored almost 1.3 points per possession. That's a really good number in terms of like just converting those opportunities. Synergy has similar numbers, uh, which John Chu and passed along this week. Um, the Hawks ranked fifth last year in transition points per possession, which is good, of course, but only 26th. And percentage of possessions that were actually in transition, similar numbers to cleaning the glass. So in short, they did not run very much, and they were still pretty good when they ran. Now, I, I've done this a lot in the past. I thought the Hawks played too slow the last couple of years, especially after the Lloyd Pierce was uh, – Lloyd Pierce and Nick, Nick, Nick McMillan change. It's also, that's also very in keeping with Nate's philosophy, so I'm not terribly surprised by that. But also – um, the Hawks never get steals. That's also part of this, which might be changing now with Jante Murray. So last year, the Hawks were third lowest in the league in frequency of transition off steals because they just never get steals for the most part. Uh, also, um, they're still all they're still also below average in transition to distance off, off of rebounds, even though they were a little bit better than that off of than, than they were off of steals. So I think it's possible the Hawks do play a little bit faster this year to answer the question. Um, one reason, and the big one for me anyway, is personnel based, and that's because of Murray. Um, Murray is a grab-and-go guy. They have not had that as much in the last couple of years. Trey does like to push tempo on his own, but he's not the one that's like re- that's, that's rebounding on his own necessarily and pushing in that grab-and-go way, like Westbrook-style way. Um, Murray is very good at creating pace if he wants to after getting his rebound. And again, he's an awesome rebounder for a guard, so that definitely helps. Also, he shot very, very well um, on the break last year. 82% transition layups last year for Jante Murray. I think they should try to prioritize that as a grab and go option, kind of give him license to go ahead and do that when he's on the floor. Whenever, if he can, if he can go ahead and put, push the pace, go ahead and do that, and uh, maybe change the fortunes of the transition offense as a whole. Also, Gallinari not on the team anymore. That's the other thing that's about this is sort of um, personnel based. Gallo. Uh, kind of no matter who they use in that spot between Jalen Johnson, Mo Harkless, whoever, um, Gallo is a very, very slow-paced player, and that can hold back tempo at times. He didn't, he didn't play all that much, like half the minutes, but still, uh, Gallo is like uniquely slow in tempo. Uh, Capella is a pretty slow-paced uh, p- player as well, so that's part of this as well. And again, Nate is not a high-tempo coach. There are times when Nate will refer to, um, by the way, basically every coach does this, about wanting to push the pace and play fast. Nate says that there's not a lot of evidence that he actually wants that for the most part compared to other teams. But um, I kind of want to see if there's an organizational shift towards pace because I think uh, the Hawks could be utilized by that, especially when you're playing a little bit smaller now with Trey and Murray having the having two guys that can really, really push the ball if they want to go ahead and do that. That should help. I'll have my eye on this for sure to answer the question. I think that could help the Hawks 
Obviously, on offense, they were really good last year in general. But I think the half court offense might be a little bit worse this year. So trends, transitioning frequency, and maybe emphasizing that a little bit more would definitely help things. And I'll keep an eye on that for sure in the coming days. But good question there from Christopher. Um, last thing on the podcast before we get out of here is uh, our friends at Bet Online, which I kind of tweet, teased earlier with regard to the ad read. Um, Bet Online released updated conference and division odds as of Wednesday in the league after the Brooklyn Nets change as kind of the, probably the biggest reason why they did that. The Hawks now are 25 to one to win the Eastern Conference. That's the seventh best wads in the East. Um, Boston's the favorite at plus 250. Then Milwaukee at three to one. Brooklyn is four to one with KD back. Um, Miami at seven, sorry, uh, 15 to two. Philly at eight to one. Then a pretty big drop off to Toronto at 20 to one. Hawks at 25 to one. Chicago 28 to one. New York 40 to one. And Cleveland at 60 to one. So if you don't know the betting stuff, um, basically, if you want to bet on the Hawks to win the East, you can bet a um, dollar and win 25 if they were to actually win the East. Um, as for the division, the Hawks are nine to five, which is about plus 180 to win the Southeast Division. Um, so they're number two in the division. Uh, Miami is the favorite at four to seven odds. So Miami is still a pretty big favorite after the, winning the division last year pretty comfortably over the Hawks, but the Hawks are number two in the division. Um, the Hornets are 11 to one. Washington is 33 to one. And Orlando is 200 to one to win the division. That's pretty crazy, actually. Um, I'm not sure that they, uh, in fact, I am sure that they're not very good probably right now, but um, I actually think value-wise, that's not the craziest thing in the world. Maybe followed by Kara just like lights the world on fire. Anyway, uh, yeah, Hawks number two in the Southeast, nine to five. Um, last thing, by the way, I want to say before we get out of here, is I just kind of found, I tweeted about this, so if you saw this, you probably already did see this on my Twitter feed, but a weird quirk in the schedule that I missed until now. The Hawks play a game Every single Wednesday night from October 12th, which is preseason game, to February 1st, every single Wednesday for 17 weeks in a row. Now, people are kind of responding to this, like, who cares? Listen, if you have a commitment on Wednesday nights, which people do, it's a, it's a big church night. It's big, like, other things. There's other, like, community things around that. Um, Hawks fans, by some of them may not love that. Uh, 17 weeks in a row they play on Wednesdays. Also, that means if they're ever playing a game on Tuesday or Thursday – then it's back to back every single time. Tuesday, and Thursdays are pretty big NBA nights in some ways, especially Thursdays early in the, se- early in the season. Um, after that, actually, it's kind of a weird quirk again because after that, they have a lot of Wednesdays off. They have two off in February, they have three off in March. So it's basically just a weird scheduling thing where they just play every Wednesday for 17 weeks in a row. It's very strange. Also, there's very light Tuesday schedule before that because of the back to backs. Presumably, I'm going to have a little bit limiting that. So again, if you have a standing Wednesday commitment, It's going to be pretty tough for a while, for like three and a half months, basically, between the Hawks playing their second to last exhibition game on the 12th of October through February 1st. Every Wednesday, pencil it in. And by the way, I think all of those, but maybe one, are like 7 or 7.30 tips. There's one late game, like a 10 o'clock start on the West Coast Strip in January. But uh, for the most part, the Hawks basically, you can set your clock by them, 7 or 7.30, maybe 8 uh, starts on Wednesday nights for three and a half months. So file that away, a little bit of a weirdness thing at the end of the podcast. But alas, that was uh, fascinating to me in the scheduling um, complex at this point in time. So, okay, that'll be it for today's podcast. Please subscribe to the show. I appreciate it. everyone's already done that, but it really does help the podcast. I know people always ask me how to help the show. Um, and the biggest thing you could possibly do is subscribe and download and click the podcast um, across pl- across platforms. If you want to do the best possible thing to help the show, what you can do basically is to subscribe on like ten platforms, download the podcast, uh, YouTube, same thing. What, look at old look at old podcasts on YouTube, download old podcasts on on Apple or Spotify, etc. That's the best way to help the show. Also, invest in the podcast by sharing it with your friends. That's also huge along the way. And also follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter, as you can see on the screen on YouTube, at BT Roland. And that will be back probably not till next week at this point in time. But I promise we'll have a new, a new show by the end of August. And we'll be diving in, ramping up until September. So please stay tuned for all of that. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And we'll see you all next time.